in Germany, the education system is entirely public. Uh, the healthcare system is also predominantly public. Uh, and also uh, home prices and home rents are fairly low compared to the US. I don't know a single family that sends their children to private school. So almost every family sends their children to public daycares, which are free of charge uh, for the most part, to public elementary and secondary schools. And also the university system is al almost completely um, public and universities don't charge tuition fees. And so because there are no elite high schools and actually not even elite universities uh, really, um, the pressure for families to compete financially with others or with the rich um, for good or relatively good education for their children is just much more limited in, in Germany compared to the US. Hi, I'm Till van Trieck. I'm a professor of socioeconomics at the University of Duisburg-Essen in Germany. And currently I'm uh, the Theodor Heuss visiting professor at the New School for Social Research uh, in New York City. When I first got interested in economics, uh, one of the texts that fascinated me most was um, a short but very famous essay written by the British economist John Maynard Keynes in 1930 on economic possibilities for our grandchildren. And in 1930, Keynes predicted that 100 years later, so by 2030, um, a typical full-time worker uh, in a rich country would work uh, as little as 15 hours a week uh, or just three days uh, a week. And Keynes's idea was that because the capitalist system is very good at generating technological innovations, uh, productivity growth, that at some point uh, we would be in a position as a society um, to satisfy everyone's uh, material needs if everyone just works um, a few hours uh, a week. And Keynes actually predicted a coming age of leisure and abundance. And so I, I think an interesting question for social scientists to ask uh, nowadays is why are we all still working such long hours um, and uh, d despite the fact that actually the level of productivity is extremely high in the rich world today exactly as Keynes predicted um, and whether we would not be better off as a society both socially but also uh, possibly environmentally if we all worked um, a lot less. Why does the pattern of income distribution um, look so very different across rich countries, despite the fact that all the rich countries essentially face the same challenges as technological change, uh, trade globalization, financial globalization. Um, and what are the implications uh, of these different patterns of income distribution in different countries for national growth models, for macroeconomic stability or instability, uh, and also for um, ecological sustainability. So for example, why is it that households in the United States uh, work longer hours, save less, and have higher debt than households in Germany? Um, why do the United States and other uh, Anglo-Saxon liberal market economies uh, have persistent current account deficits and much higher levels of private debt, whereas Germany and other um, coordinated market economies have these persistent current account surpluses uh, and are excessively dependent on exports for generating um, aggregate demand uh, and, and employment. The defining feature of inequality in the US, as I see it, is the explosion since the early 1980s of the share of total household income going to the very top of the income distribution, the famous top 1%. Now, if the top 1% get richer and consume more, this will shift the consumption norms for all of society. And in the literature, uh, this phenomenon is um, known as trickle-down consumption or expenditure cascades. We know from psychology that status comparisons are local and upward looking. So uh, if the top 1% get richer and spend more on uh, positional consumption goods, which signal a high social status, such goods as uh, education for the children, uh, housing, uh, traveling, uh, but possibly also healthcare, then this puts pressure on those households just below 
the top of the income distribution to also uh, increase their spending on these uh, positional goods in order to um, defend their social status, so to speak. Just take education as an example. Uh, most parents, uh, of course, uh, want a good education for their children in some absolute sense. But what really matters for the future career prospects uh, of your children is the relative quality of education compared with others. Or rather, in fact, the relative reputation of the schools that your children graduate from. And so if the top 1% uh, spend increasing amounts of money on tuition fees um, to get their children um, a spot on the best schools, um, then this puts immediate pressure on upper middle class families, parents, to also spend more money on education if they still want their children to uh, go to the best schools that, that money can buy. But the only way for them to do this, actually, uh, if their income doesn't grow uh, as fast as the income of uh, the top 1%, is to sacrifice their enjoyment of non-positional goods. So non-positional goods are things or activities that uh, people do value because uh, they enhance their well-being, but they do not signal a high social status. So the most important non-positional goods would be leisure time, saving, and financial security, or a low level of personal debt. And so because the, the share of income going to the top 1% increased so much in the United States since the early 1980s, especially those income groups just below them, the upper middle class, um, began to work longer hours, save less, and go increasingly into debt um, uh, since the early 19, 1980s. If a higher top 1% income share leads to lower saving and higher debt among non-rich households, then the long-term consequence of this, uh, of course, will be higher wealth inequality. And this, of course, at some point uh, may pose a threat to democracy, uh, but it may also uh, increase financial fragility in the economy um, and increase the risk of a household debt crisis, as we saw uh, in the Great Recession uh, of 2007 through, through 2009. But um, ever-rising consumption norms that may be driven by top-end uh, income inequality uh, also have negative um, ecological consequences because if uh, consumption norms keep rising and households, especially uh, in the upper, upper middle class, work very long hours, um, then obviously we produce more, we consume more than would be the case if uh, top end income inequality was lower, uh, consumption norms were lower and everybody worked less. Uh, households in Germany definitely enjoy more non-positional goods. Um, they work shorter hours, they save more, and also they have um, lower debt. So in other words, trickle-down consumption uh, or expenditure cascades have been much weaker in Germany compared to, to the United States. And this is so despite the fact that, um, in fact, in Germany and other coordinated market economies, uh, the degree of income inequality has actually increased to a similar extent as uh, in the United States, at least when we look at very broad summary indicators of income inequality, such as the Gini coefficient of disposable household income. I think there are two main reasons why rising inequality in Germany has not contributed to such strongly rising consumption norms in Germany uh, compared to the US. The first reason is that the pattern of income distribution is just very different in Germany uh, as compared to the US. Uh, it is true that uh, the Gini coefficient of household income has increased, but this is due mostly to an increase in income inequality in the bottom half of the income distribution. So the low wage sector has grown substantially, especially since the early 2000s, and poverty has become more of an issue. But the share of total household income going to the very top of the distribution, the top 1% income share, has not increased nearly as much in Germany as it has in the United States. And there are different reasons for that. One is that um, 
top executive compensation is much lower in Germany. Also, German companies don't engage as much in very high dividend payments or share buybacks. And one reason for that is that we have worker co-determination uh, in Germany. And also, um, many important firms in Germany are actually family firms. They are not listed on the stock, ma stock market, and so they are not subject to um, US-style shareholder value orientation, and they are also not subject to winner-take-all uh, labor markets for top executives. And so because the top 1% income share has not increased as much, uh, the rich have not in uh, increased their consumption uh, on positional goods as much as in Germany, and hence the pressure that was put on the middle class, the upper middle class, to keep up with the rich was just much more limited. The second reason why um, consumption norms in the middle class in Germany are much more immune to changes in income distribution uh, is related to welfare state institutions. Um, so in Germany, the education system is entirely public. Uh, the healthcare system is also predominantly public. Uh, and also uh, home prices and home rents are fairly low compared to the US for a number of institutional um, reasons. And these are just some reasons why the scope for positional arms races is just much more limited in, in Germany compared to the US. In Germany, I don't know a single family that sends their children to private school. So almost every family sends their children to public daycares, which are free of charge uh, for the most part, to public elementary and secondary schools. And also the university system is al almost completely um, public and universities don't charge tuition fees. And so because there are no elite high schools, and actually not even elite universities, uh, really, um, the pressure for families to compete financially with others or with the rich um, for good or relatively good education for their children is just, um, is just uh, much more limited in, in Germany compared to the US. Well, this is, of course, uh, just anecdotal evidence, but it is actually consistent with um, what we find in our own empirical um, research, where we actually find that the extent to which the education system relies on private financing uh, is po positively correlated with average work hours um, in a panel of 18 rich uh, countries for the period since the early 1980s. Uh, my co-authors and I um, try to understand two main puzzles. The first is why haven't average work hours in the rich countries decreased much more sharply uh, since the early 1980s? In fact, in some uh, rich countries, especially those with an increase, with especially those with an increasing income inequality, average hours work per worker or average hours work per person have actually increased, uh, especially in the 1980s and 1990s. And this goes completely against a long-term uh, trend um, towards shorter working hours as uh, wages increase, as labor productivity uh, increases. It also goes against a cross-sectional pattern where uh, rich, high productivity economies typically have lower working hours than poorer economies with lower labor productivity. The second puzzle that we try to understand is why do average working hours vary so much across rich countries? So for example, the average German worker uh, has worked between 200 and 300 hours per year less than the average American worker uh, in the past decades. And this is a huge difference. And uh, in our research, we find evidence that um, these differences are due to differences in income inequality and also due to differences in the wage bargaining system and differences in uh, welfare institutions. Historically, uh, the poor always worked more than the rich. Um, this was true throughout the 19th century, and it was even true um, until um, the 1970s, uh, when workers with a relatively low hourly real wage 
had a much larger chance of working very long hours than workers with a high hourly real wage. And the famous sociologist and economist Tolstein Veblen, who wrote in the 19th century, um, actually uh, referred to the rich as the leisure class. Now, this situation has completely turned around uh, since the early 1980s. And nowadays, especially in countries with a high uh, top household income share, um, it is actually those workers who have a relatively high real wage that work the longest hours. So my interpretation of this is that the explosion of top household incomes puts, has put the strongest pressure on the upper middle class, those income groups that are located just below the top 1% in the income distribution ladder, because it is these upper middle class workers that can still realistically hope to compete with the top 1% in terms of social status. Uh, and so for these workers, putting in long hours uh, is a way to keep up with the positional consumption spending by the top 1%. And of course, it is also for them a way to signal a high, a strong commitment and um, strong career ambitions to their, to their employers. Well, I basically agree with Keynes um, that many people um, would find it very attractive to live in a world where we all uh, worked much shorter hours than we are currently used to. And in fact, we know empirically that many workers would like to work less, but only if that didn't mean that um, their social status would be affected. And so, in my view, the main obstacles to reducing working hours, especially in countries like the United States and other Anglo-Saxon liberal market economies, are one, uh, the very high degree of top-end income inequality, uh, two, um, the lack of centralized wage bargaining institutions, which would be a way to internalize, um, at least to some extent, the positional externalities uh, implied um, by uh, positional consumption spending. And three, uh, the lack of public provision of um, basic uh, social services. And so I guess the main policy implications of uh, my work, at least for a country like the United States, would be that uh, more centralized wage bargaining institutions, a lower degree of top-end income inequality, and a universal provision of um, public education and public health care uh, would be ways to uh, make shorter working hours um, a realistic and very attractive option for many workers. So in countries like Germany, uh, I think it would actually be much easier to pursue policies of working time uh, reduction because top-end income inequality is relatively low. Wage bargaining institutions are relatively centralized and also we have a universal welfare state. In fact, reducing working hours would also be a way of uh, addressing uh, Germany's structural current account surplus, which has caused many problems for uh, financial stability, macroeconomic stability in Europe and globally, uh, because the structural current account surplus of Germany essentially means that Germans spend less th than they produce. And shorter working hours would be just one way of um, bringing production and consumption in current account surplus countries more into balance.